Hello, hello. Wait, should I scowl again? How about I do this look this time? Hmm. Hmm. So we're uh, waiting for people to show up. I'm making a weird face at nothing. Hello, hello. Hi. Welcome to Geek Speaks Greek. I am your geek, George O'Connor. Clearly speaking English, the Greek in reference is... Well, <laughs> I already screwed up. The reference to Greek is uh, Greek mythology. This is a live cast, we'll call it podcast, whatever you want to call it, where uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I talk about Greek mythology, different characters, be they goddess, god, heroes, or monsters. Now, before we get too far into this, I'm going to address this again later, we're going to have to do a scheduling talk pretty soon. There's some things coming up on the horizon that are going to be uh, changing the schedule of Geek Speaks Greek. In fact, let me already say thank you today for those of you who are showing up because uh, we're starting a little bit later than usual. I had some meetings until last second, so I uh, didn't actually start this at the customary 3 o'clock. So today we're at 3.30, so I'm just going to give you a little bit extra time to come in because uh, I know this is different. Hi, everybody. Hi. Okay, we got some people showing up now. Okay. <clears throat> Before we get too far into this, I just want to once again mention that I have the uh, best fans in the world. And one of the ways I know I have the best fans in the world is because they're always sending me amazing artwork. And today is no exception. I have a bunch of stuff to share. Um, unfortunately for folks who uh, send me on other channels other than um, being able to send it to me directly to my email address, which I should just post up here really quick. My email is georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. Because I was in uh, meetings today, I didn't get a chance, unfortunately, to grab other people's stuff. So this is only stuff that got sent to the email. So sorry, folks. I know because some of you send it elsewhere. Up first, we have a piece by Eleanor. And I feel like Eleanor, I haven't seen one of yours for a while. So I'm super excited to see this. Uh, she was inspired by, uh, what was it? What day is today? What are days? Today is Wednesday, right? On Monday, we did Orion, the Mighty Hunter. So she drew her own Orion fighting the scorpion. So I really love this. So first off, there's Helios, because we always have Helios there. Here's Orion. He's like holding his sword up in the sky, or actually his knife, I guess, because I decided, you know, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe Eleanor has a different take on it. Holding his knife, and he's fighting the scorpion. Look at the scorpion's tail. I just love the colors here. Eleanor, thank you so much for sending it in. I feel like I haven't seen stuff from you for a bit, so so excited to see it again. Um, now this one, uh, oops, this is from Liam. And Liam drew Aeolus. If you guys don't know who Aeolus is, Aeolus is the nephew of Heracles. He's the guy who, when he's a little kid, he goes with Her Let me hold this up so you can see it better. Aeolus is the guy who goes with Heracles to fight the Hydra. It's actually Aeolus who is the one who has the idea to burn the Hydra's heads. Aeolus has a connection with torches throughout his career. Because then, again, later, when Heracles has been poisoned by the blood of the Hydra, we're going to come on to that. We're going to, you know, cover that again today. And he's begging to be let loose from this mortal coil because the pain is so awful. It's Aeolus who lights the funeral pyre that, like, Heracles actually throws himself on when he's immolated. Man, not a lot of happy endings for Greek heroes, you know? Now, next we have, this is a drawing from Jamie, who drew Eos, the Dawn, who is definitely one of those characters I need to do. Now, there's some cool stuff going on here. I'm going to do a little bit of my own interpretations here. Uh, I feel like these kind of swirly spots going up her robes are kind of meant to be reminiscent of clouds. And then she has this kind of cape that almost looks like the waves of color. Um... There's this, you know, whenever you see Eos mentioned in the ancient stories, they always refer to as rosy-fingered because she brings the colors. I don't know if you've ever woken up that early. I know my girlfriend has certainly never done that. But if you wake up early in the morning, you know, it's like a sunset. There's a lot of beautiful colors. So she's always kind of colored in these beautiful things. So I love that idea. Um, let's see what else we have today. Um, here is a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a couple from Moira. Moira's dad wrote, uh, she also wants you to know that it was his fault for not submitting in drawings on Monday, and she was correct that it was his fault. So, you know, shame on you, Moira's dad, but, you know, you made up for it today. So first, oh, wait, is this? I'm Okay, so I think, so we have, check it out. It's going to be a little bit crooked because I can't, I, I can't really turn it, but I'm pretty sure we're dealing with an, an IO here, right? And she's in front of the moon. 
because I mean, look at the hair. She has that kind of the Egyptian look that I was talking about when I did Io on Friday. And that would make sense that that was the one that was maybe supposed to get there Monday. And then Maura sent another drawing. Now this one, there's Artemis. But what's that shadow? And like, what's going on? It's like a sunset or something? I mean, I think so right there, pretty sure that's Orion, right? Hunting Artemis all the time. And like Artemis, but is she casting her shadow on the moon? Or is that the sun? Or is that like, is that Nyx? I'm not really sure. I mean, there's some cool stuff going there. I like this imagery. Um, <laughs> I just wanna, he's hard to see, but look at the little Orion. <laughs> Let's see what else we got today. Um, ooh, this one is from Jake. And, um, What's actually pretty cool here, there's a term used in this. Uh, Jake's, um, oh, Jake himself wrote, since you're doing centaurs, I thought I would draw a scene from the centaur amaki. What's the centaur amaki? I'm actually gonna cover that today, but it basically means battle of the centaurs. Centaurs. And so here's the picture he drew. I mean, look at this detail. So like at the bottom it says uh, centaur amaki, centaur amaki. But then like, look, you can see the centaur in the middle and they're holding like, just huge chunk of like tree or granite and we're going to talk a lot about this stuff um you did an excellent job of guessing some of the things i'm be covering today and then let's see uh two more things real quick and then we'll start getting into the actual uh gist of this episode so uh here we have from uh oh this is from yehi yeah, he, I just I didn't get a chance to check these out before. Seems that yeah, he has started picking up Love and Rockets, which is my favorite comic book series. I'm gonna have to read this later. Love and Rockets is great. It's not for little kids, but the guy, one of the guys, especially Jaime Hernandez, is in my opinion the best comics artist who's ever, you know, maybe not ever lived, but who's currently alive. So here we have. This is a picture. I think she called this one lineages. So in the background we see Kronos and Rhea, and then we see up front Hera and Zeus. And it's kind of this moment, Hera's holding the apple. Well, actually, is it the golden apple that th is thrown by Eris? Is it one of the apples of the Hesperides? There's a lot of golden apples. And then they're backed by their respective messengers. You know, Hermes has his right, I mean, Zeus has his right-hand man, Hermes, and then Hera has uh, Iris back there. Beautiful painting, beautiful colors. Let's see what else we got today. Oh, this one is, this is really funny. Uh, so we were kind of talking about like how um, there's a possibility uh, we were talking about with um, Orion that maybe Orion's mother is Yuriali, the other Gorgon. And we're kind of, well, one of the other Gorgons was Thano, like the sister of Medusa. And Poseidon already had a kid with Medusa, or at least, two, at least one, Pegasus, and maybe Chrysaor. So she <laughs> he drew this really weird comic where basically Athena comes up to her uncle's like, hey, look, I have snakes now. What do you think? And I mean, she's got the little bubbles around her. I don't know if that's because she's up underwater or if she's drunk, but he's like, ew, gross. And I have to admit, that's kind of gross. I think she's kind of hinting like, hey, you wanna, like, I don't know. That's definitely out of character for Athena. It's a funny joke. I think it's probably Eris in disguise, right? Cause like how better to cause trouble than to be that. And then this one, uh, this is a funny little one. Look how funny these drawings are. Helios heals Orion's eyes. We talked about this, how after he heal, Orion is blinded for being a creepy assaulter, he goes to the end, he's guided to the ends of the earth where Helios heals his blindness, which is kind of like a weird thing. It's like Helios does that, so he's like, I'm gonna heal you, and he sets his eyes on fire. Look at this little doughboy Orion, I love it. He's going, ah, my eyes are on fire, it's so bright. Bright? So his eyes were healed, because now he can see, because his eyes are on fire. That's pretty funny. Pretty dark, actually. Uh, great job, Yehi. And then, um, finally, this one is from Renka. And Renka, actually, I, I wanna say thank you. Renka mentioned that she is, um, she just got VIP membership at Word. Word's my favorite local independent bookstore. She mentioned that she bought my new book, Unrig, there, and will possibly even be able to get it signed. And I'm just gonna let you know, and this is true for any of you guys, if you go to Word, like today, and buy a copy of Unrig, you will get it signed. Because tomorrow, I'm making a rare trip outside of my house. I'm going to ride my bike to Word and sign the copies of Unrig they have there that they've already sold. So if you wanna get a signed copy of Unrig, and I'll do a drawing and everything, go do that now. But, so, thank you, Renka. Thanks for giving me a chance to plug my book. And here is her drawing. 
Uh, apparently, uh, if you guys remember watching the Orion episode, someone, and I guess it was Ranka's mom, asked about how come um, uh, Artemis doesn't have open-toed shoes. And I explained how in Hunters and Ancient Greece, they wrap these kind of soft skins around their feet so they wouldn't, like, stab their toes on twigs. So that inspired Ranka to draw an entire comic of Artemis and Orion going shoe shopping. Look at Orion. He's like, I love this Orion. Look at his pose. He's just so cranky. Maybe just some Mary Janes would work, he's saying. And she's like looking at all different types of shoes. Are there any winged shoes? That's a, wait, those ones, look at these ones here. They look like they got little cow faces or bird faces. This is great. Ranka, thank you so much for sending this in. So, okay. If you, and apologies again to people who weren't able to send it. It was just, it was kind of a last, I was running around like a lunatic and it's gonna be, I'm entering a really weirdly busy time of my schedule. So, um, if at all possible, if you want to send me a drawing, please send it to my email at georgiaconnorbooks at gmail.com. If you are unable to do that for whatever reason, I will try to get it. But some days like today, I haven't slowed down since I woke up at like 7.30 and I just didn't get a chance to. Uh, if you want to catch old episodes of Geek Speaks Grease, <laughs> Geek Speaks Grease? Wait, Geek Speaks Greek, check it out on my YouTube, youtube.com slash user slash George Lumpkins. Okay. And really quickly, because now it looks like I have a good group of you guys here, and I'll mention this again at the end. I have some news about scheduling that I think is going to be a little bit of a bummer, but it's not the biggest bummer in the world. So first, for the rest of this week, on Friday, I was going to do satyrs, because I figure centaurs and satyrs together. But it turns out, I didn't realize this, my publisher set this up for me just now, I'm going to be doing an AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything, on Reddit for my book, on rig. Here's a sign for it, but it's backwards, so it's not really helpful. But a Friday at 3 p.m., so instead of coming here on Instagram, if you want to see me, you want to see me talk about Unrig, go to Reddit, and it's going to be you slash Unrig graphic novel, and I'll be doing that on Friday. So that means, unfortunately, no Geek Speaks Greek on Friday. I'll post some more stuff about this on my Instagram. And here's the other bad news. The week after that, I'm going on vacation. I know. I haven't gone away since everything began. Really haven't, I don't think I've missed an episode, unfortunately, but I'm going upstate just for a little bit of recovery time, just to kind of get out of my little apartment in the city. So there's going to be a week that I am not going to be able to do Geek Speaks Greek. So I apologize in advance for that. I'll try to post other stuff. I don't even know if I'm going to have access to internet, though. So it might be kind of hard. Then, when I come back, I'm going to have to shift the schedule of my Geek e e Speaks Greek. It's still going to be at 3 p.m., but instead of Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, it's going to be Tuesday and Thursday, at least for a little while. I'm working very hard on Dionysus right now. And Geek Speaks Greek is really fun, but it actually does take a lot of my day, time of my day. And there's a lot of other side projects, things you're going to start hearing about soon. I'm working at the same time, and I'm just running out of time to do stuff. So I'm going to be moving Geek Speaks Greek to two days a week, but maybe I'll do something else to make it more special. Um, Ranka asks, can you go with us? As long as you socially distance, of course, yes, you can come. Which means you have to be six feet away from me all the time, which would be hard to be in the car. Uh, how dare I go on vacation? I kind of feel like that. I'm kind of like, how dare I go on vacation? I haven't done that yet. Uh, it's been a while. Been a while. Um, <clears throat> so, didn't even get a chance to check out to see if my pens work today. Okay. Today... We're actually talking about something I'm pretty excited about. This is something we wanted to talk about for a while, kept getting bumped down, including it was gonna be on Monday, and um, uh, I think it was Megan who was like, hey, um, <laughs> Nip Fury asked, why do I write like I'm running out of time? I write day and night like I'm running out of time. Um, Cause I am, we all are, that's the, that's the human thing. Um, we we're gonna do centaurs, that's what we're doing today, centaurs. We we're gonna do centaurs on Monday, but then she mentioned Orion, I'm like, I'm gonna do Orion. But today we're doing centaurs. And I forget who it was asked me on Instagram, am I gonna be doing famous centaurs? Because I chose a picture of Kiran, or am I gonna be doing all the cent, like just, you know, generic centaurs? And I'm like, both, I'm gonna do both. But first, I'm gonna just talk about centaurs. So, the name centaur is kind of obscure. Nobody, know, you know how I like to go into what these things mean? Uh, nobody's really sure what it means. It clearly seems to have, you know, there's the Minotaur, which means the bull of Minos. Centaur has that same root, so it's got bull in there. I've heard some people hypothesize it means bull slayer, 
which I'm like, okay, I really haven't heard Sen to mean kill before. I've also read, and I think this is honestly what it is. So basically, the Minotaur came first. That was the, that, you know, it's a really ancient monster that the Greeks concocted. And he was half man, half bull. And then sometime after that, they came up with the idea of monsters that were half horse, half bull. And they kind of, it, even though it doesn't make sense linguistically, they grabbed that tar, because for them it meant like half at that point. So it was like a centaur. <laughs> People are now just doing the lyrics of Hamilton there. This is what ha Hamilton, my gosh, it's so good. Like that and like Hades Town, that's like all I listen to anymore. So, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that's what I think. I think it's just that they, and like Sen, maybe it means horse. I don't know. This is just me kind of hypothesizing. So where do centaurs come from? We know where the Minotaur comes from. You know, there was Queen Pasiphae. She was the uh, queen of Minos. And there was a passion put upon her for a bull by, um, by Poseidon. And she was with the bull. And then she had baby Asterion. It was a half man, half cow. And it's kind of a, very easy to trace. And it's very upsetting. Watch that episode, if you will, on my YouTube, youtube.com slash youtube or such George Olympians, where I kind of land pretty squarely on the day. I think the Minotaur is probably just a... A really big, really strong man who's half cow and is unfortunately about as smart as a half man, half cow you'd expect it to be. He's, I don't think he's evil. I don't think he eats people. But centaurs, they're kind of a, a wild, unruly bunch. How am I going to... I'm not actually sure which way I'm going to start. If I'm going to start with famous cent... Let's start with generic centaurs. So what does the name Ixion mean to you? It's definitely a name we've brought up here before. It's definitely a name that you've seen in my books. Ixion in case you need a reminder of this, was the first murderer. He was a king of the Lapith people, and he killed his father-in-law. Just threw him in a fire, like burned him to death. And Zeus, one of his big traits, we talk about this a lot, is Zeus's job is to be kind of the upholder of like social justice and the natural order of things. Murdering is a pretty big blow against the natural order of things. And Zeus is like, I don't know what to do here. What should I do? So he doesn't want to just blow him up straight up. He's like, why did he do this? You know, Zeus understands having issues with dads, for instance, right? Even though it's his father-in-law, you know what I'm saying? He summons Ixion to come and speak to him on Mount Olympus. And the way this story goes, Ixion, who's clearly got some issues, is on Mount Olympus, basically defending his very existence against the king of the gods. And he lays eyes on Hera and he's like, yeah, I like that. And he hits on her, goes after her. Now, Hera, of course, could like you know, flick him with her finger and he'd hit the moon. And she, she's like, she goes to Zeus. She's like, that guy was like coming after me. And Zeus is like, no, he wasn't. And she's like, yeah, he was. And so Zeus is like, because I don't know, even though Zeus cheats on his wife like every 30 seconds, he doesn't fully believe her because Zeus has a lot of issues. He's like, well, okay, let's put this to the test. And he kind of creates this figure of clouds like this woman of clouds who looks just like Hera. It, for all intents and purpose, purposes, it's Hera. And then he just kind of like lets her wander about. She's alive in a sort. At least she can pull off the act of seeming alive. And Ixion, who's still on Mount Olympus at this point, still pleading his case like, yeah, I'm a murderer. Oh. He's with the cloud. He attacks the cloud. He's with it. He's like the biggest creep. Uh, we might have a new biggest creep here, by the way. We might have somebody who finally beat Theseus. Who will come in today? Theseus, still big creep. And Zeus is like, well, he pops up. He's like, so uh, what's this about? You're with my wife, who's actually just clouds. And Ixion's like, oh. And Zeus kills him, blows him up with a lightning bolt. And that's how Ixion is affixed to the giant spinning wheel of fire that lights up Tartarus. If you were wondering where you've seen Ixion before, in my book, Hades, that's his position. He's chained to a spinning wheel. It's the only light source in Tartarus, and he spins around for eternity. He's being punished for being that first murderer, but he's also being punished for what he thought he did to Hera. Now, let's go back to that cloud for a second. Kind of sad to be that cloud. Let's give the cloud an identity. Not everybody does. Sometimes it's just a cloud. But the cloud, you'll learn, has to stick around for a while after this. Like, Zeus basically creates life for this purpose. The cloud, let's call her Nephili, because that's her name. Uh, she hangs around for a bit, and uh, she is, um, she's pregnant with the child of Ixion, or children of Ixion, depending on the version. So, um, 
in... I think it is... Let me see if I actually wrote these notes down, because I wrote these notes down last night, and I forgot what I wrote. Um, hmm. Now, I don't remember who. In some versions, I wanted to give you guys the names so you can look it up later, but you just have to take my words for us. In some versions, they have one child. That child's name is Centauros. Can you guess what Centauros looks like? He's half man, half horse. And then Centauros goes out, and he's on the hill of the hills of Mount, um, was it Pelion? And he goes off, and he just finds all these different horses, and he's just with the horses. And then he gives birth. Like between that, he's the father of the entire race of centaurs, an entire race of like half men, half cow, uh, cows, half horses. In other versions, all the centaurs are the children of Nephili and Ixion. I mean, I kind of want to go with that version. It's just easier. But then again, the other version that they're actually really horses, it's kind of interesting. So the centaurs are kind of like these. There's actually a line. It's in, um, gosh, I think it's in Pindar, I'm pretty sure, where he says that they are hated by all. Because they're kind of like, the gods look at them like, we know what happened here. We, like, that's kind of bad. And they're really wild and uncouth. And they're kind of dangerous. They represent, they're half human, but they represent the bestial side of humans. And like, man, let's not kid ourselves. Humans can be beasts. It happens all the time. But like centaurs are more reliably beasts. They just give in to their animal passions all the time. With one exception. The, sometimes he's the leader. Sometimes he just lives adjacent to them. But there's this one centaur named Chiron, or Chiron, depending how you want to pronounce it. He actually has a completely different background from them. He's not part of this whole Ixion, Nephili, the cloud sort of mixing of stuff. He is actually the son of Kronos. So what? Yeah, Chiron is the half brother of Zeus and Hera and Demeter and Poseidon, everybody. But his mom is different. His mom is the nymph Philyra? Philyra, yeah, because it sounds like Philly. That's how I remember it. Like Philly's a horse. And the story for this, like, why does Kronos have a child that's half horse, half man? Well, this is weird. We actually asked this a few weeks ago. Somebody asked this in the Q&A portion, and I actually couldn't think of anything. But I realized this story fits this. They, someone had asked, can Titans change shape? And in this one particular story, at least one version of this, Kronos does seem to change shape. Kronos is with Philyra when Rhea, his queen, catches them. And it's kind of shades of like Io and Zeus. Instead of, however, Kronos transforming Philyra into a horse, he himself turns into a horse and runs away. And somehow, that kind of weird half and half magic there, that comes down to Pardon me, I burped. That comes down to Chiron, who is now born half god. Half, well, like half titan, actually. Half horse. Well, he's more than that, really, if you think about it. That's just his physicality. So he's kind of almost on an Olympian level there, right? So the Olympians are the second generation titans, so to speak. You know, they're the children of Rhea and Kronos. But Kronos has a kid with a nymph, in this case, Philyra. So he's not quite at an Olympian level, certainly. Uh, he doesn't seem to be able to change shape at all, which kind of, I feel like, goes to Titans, too. This is just a weird and, like, one story out where he does. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they can. It's just really hard, and he just, maybe they could do it once, and he really, he shot it that one time. He's like, well, I turned into a horse. Hope it was worth it. But Chiron's very different than the other centaurs. He's immortal, which is important to note. But that's going to come up again later. But he's very wise. Whereas the other centaurs are kind of given to this wild, combative, bellicose nature, he is a scholar. In fact, the ancient Greeks actually credit him with inventing healing and, and um, surgery. Like, he's supposed to be the first one to do that. And there's stories when he's young where he actually receives training himself directly from Apollo and Artemis. And Apollo instructs him on medicine, and this might be yet another instance of another character who Apollo is either the father of or trains who surpasses him. You can argue Chiron might be a better healer than even Apollo. And then he's trained to hunt by Artemis. So he's kind of like this, almost like this spiritual child of them. Um, I'm going to really quickly draw, I guess I'll draw Chiron since we're talking about him. Because really, I don't make much of a difference between him and the way I draw the other centaurs, whom 
basically, Chiron's made a few little appearances. I think his most prevalent appearance, has, or preeminent appearance, has been in um, Apollo, perhaps? Oh yeah, maybe. And then you see, every once in a while, I just draw centaurs. So, the centaurs are half horse, half man, right? And everybody pretty much knows what a centaur looks like. I've incorporated a few little horse-like elements into the human side, just because I think it looks cooler. I don't think I'm alone in doing this. I've seen other people do this. So they have like horse's ears. They have kind of a broad horse nose. Chiron I draw with a beard, but I think he's the only one I do with a beard like that. And I give him really big teeth, because if you've ever seen a horse's teeth, horse got some big teeth. Give him long hair. And he has a very powerful human build. It's uh, I don't know, should draw him holding an arrow. Because I think I've only drawn him in his instructor mode. And what's interesting about him too, like, so I mentioned he received instruction from both Apollo and Artemis. He's kind of most famous for all the heroes he himself instructs. So the part where he's appeared, oh, I didn't leave enough room for his legs, so let's make him kicking one horse leg up. I mentioned you see a, uh, quite a bit of him in um, my book Apollo, because he trains Asclepius, the greatest healer of all ancient Greece, greater than his dad, Apollo, certainly. So he's tra he trains him, but that's not the only hero he trains. He's credited with training Achilles. I know I mentioned him on the Achilles episode. So he's also he's a great warrior. He's a good thinker. He's a really good thinker. He trains Bellerophon. Uh, he trains um, he trains Peleus in some instances. Peleus will come up again in a little bit. We'll talk about him. Uh, oh, he trains Jason, you know, of the Argonauts fan fame. He's kind of like this guy that, like, if you were a hero in ancient Greece, and maybe, like, I think something all those guys I mentioned, they're kind of lower on the power scale. We're not talking Heracles or Theseus here. We're talking the guys who maybe, uh, if they have divine blood, it's a little bit more washed down. They're not, like, full-on demigods. So he's, like, the guy that really helps you amp up your skills, except Asclepius. He's a full-on demigod, but... I mean, he's all about skills. Like, Asclepius isn't a fighter. He is a healer. So it's kind of, like, fascinating. And he is, I mentioned Heracles. He is friends with Heracles. And in fact, remember I mentioned he's immortal? He's one of the rare instances I could think of where a character who is immortal surrenders their immortality. And this is a weird story. It's got a lot of echoes with other stories. It's maybe that there's some things that have been conflated here. But basically, Heracles, sometime after he killed the Hydra, comes to visit with his friend Chiron. They know each other just because, you know, it's ancient Greece. And it's like, oh, you're that really smart centaur. Like, oh, you're the hero, you're the glory of Hera. Let's, you know, talk. And they're kind of hanging out. In some versions of the story, Heracles gets in a fight with the tribe of centaurs, just the average normal centaurs, who I already mentioned before, the Ixion and Nephili children. And he starts killing them, firing his arrows at them willy-nilly. And he shoots an arrow that goes right through one of their um, legs and goes sticks into the arm of Chiron. And these arrows, because he's already fought the Hydra, are poisoned. And Chiron becomes poisoned by the Hydra. That's a cool version, but it's kind of a, the one I really think is interesting because it's just kind of sad. And it's actually told in more than one spot. I think Hygienus says it this way, also does, so does Ovid. Um, where, like, it's literally just Heracles and Chiron are hanging out, and they're just talking about stuff, and, like, talking like old friends, and Chiron is just kind of looking at, like, Heracles' tools, and he drops one of the arrows, and it just pricks him on his foot, or I guess his hoof. But because it has the blood of the Hydra, it immediately just starts burning him, and festering, and going bad, and he is immortal, and it's never gonna get better, and he's going to live forever in this immense pain. And this is a story that's sometimes offered up. We've talked before about the idea of Heracles, mortal or immortal. And they finally kind of hit on that idea. Well, Heracles does die, poisoned by the arrows of the Hydra, actually, ironically. Um, and he's burned by Aeolus, who we saw up front in the drawing by Jake, maybe Liam, I forgot. Uh, sorry, whoever <laughs> drew that excellent drawing. And um, he dies, but his mortal half goes to the underworld and his immortal half ascends to Olympus. 
well, there's another story about how Heracles achieved immortality, or it says he did, because poor Chiron is looking at an eternity of crippling pain. And he prays to Zeus, goes, I want to surrender my immortality to another. I want to give it to your son, Heracles. And Zeus transfers immortality from his half-brother, because they are half-brothers, remember, to his son, Heracles. It's kind of a cool version of it. It's got a lot of stuff you got to tell in there. I kind of like it, though. It's kind of an interesting idea. Problem is, you don't see a lot of stories of immortal Heracles, which I've already hit upon. He's kind of like, oh, you know, he dies. But, you know, let's just say it's a nice story and, like, leave it there. And because I like to mention this whenever we get a chance to tie in astrology, you ever hear of Sagittarius? It's Chiron. Zeus wants to honor the sacrifice of this, uh, of this hero, this, well, yeah, I'd say he's a hero, right? He's a god hero. He dies, so he, let's say he's a hero thing. And he takes Chiron and puts him in the stars, and that is the constellation Sagittarius. So if you're a Sagittarius, cool, you're Chiron. How neat is that? So without that mitigating influence of Chiron, who eventually passes on or moves on or something, the centaurs are just left to be just kind of wild lunatics. And they already start off as wild lunatics. So if you don't have the one centaur who kind of has his stuff together, like keep an eye on stuff, it gets pretty bad. I just want to mention actually something really funny about the design of, so I made my centaurs, I'm going to draw a full body centaur just to get one in there. I'll start with the horse body. There's the tail, there's the legs. There's a theory that centaurs came about when ancient, ancient Greek people first encountered people riding horses. And they had their minds blown. They're like, what on earth? It's these weird creatures with these huge galloping bodies. And then there was like men, like shooting arrows coming out the top of it. And that kind of makes some sense to me. Like imagine how terrifying that would be the first time you see that. Like you're used to like, we're talking this is a long time ago, you used to run into people and maybe they have masks on and they're wearing armor and they have scary swords. And all of a sudden there's these dudes who are running at like 40 miles an hour and they have like, like these arrows and their hands are free and they're just plunking full of arrows and they're on these amazingly scary beasts. Because horses are pretty intense if you have been up close to them. So there I drew just a standard generic uh, uh, centaur. Probably shouldn't have given the bow and arrow because they're kind of a little bit bestial. That's definitely a Chiron thing where he does that. And you'll see it sometimes. Sometimes in ancient art, just to make a differentiation between Chiron and the normal centaurs, actually you'll see this a lot. He has horse legs here. It's like horse leg, horse leg, horse leg, horse leg, human body. A lot of times with Chiron, it's like it almost looks like he's got a human body. His front legs are human legs. He's even wearing like a little bit of clothes up there because I guess he's you know, going to be naked if he don't. Although this part of him is naked. It's like he has the back half of a horse growing out of his butt. It's kind of funny looking. I decided not to go there because it's disturbing. It's like, what's going on? Are you giving birth to like a weird horse thing? I don't know. So <clears throat> let's go back to normal uh, garden variety centaurs. Wild and crazy. But they're all descended from Ixion, remember? So there's a little bit of kinship there. Ixion, I can't remember if it's his son or his grandson. It's probably both depending on the version. Ixion was the king of the Lapiths. Uh, well, he's down in the underworld being the son the underworld. Uh, he's pointed, he, he pointed, he's passed on his kingship to his heir, we'll call him, Pyrtheus. Now that's a name you've heard before, especially you've heard it in our Theseus episode. Pyrtheus is best buds with Theseus and Pyrtheus is a real creep. Pyrtheus is the dude who goes down to the underworld and he's like, hey, I want to marry Persephone. And Theseus should have been like, you know, Persephone is already married to Hades. Like, ostensibly maybe the most powerful god you know he's gonna be the one who we're all his guests one day he's like i don't care and they go down to the underworld and he's like i demand your wife and and hades is like very good why don't you sit here and we'll discuss this like gentlemen and he leaves him there and he's stuck to the bench and then they're both stuck to the bench until heracles comes down oh remember that guy and heracles pulls off theseus because he can get theseus up but he leaves theseus's butt theseus's butt literally rips off on this bench but Pyrtheus is stuck there forever this is before this Pyrtheus who is like, I think, let's just say he's the son of Ixion. He sees these centaurs and he's like, we're kind of like, we're kin. They're like my half brothers. I feel like I should try to invite them. So the Lapiths are having this big feast. There's a, maybe a wedding, maybe a celebration. And he invites the centaurs. He's like, come on, my brothers, let's break bread together. 
Let's see if this will be a brand new era between Centaur and Lapitz. Remember how we up front we mentioned Centaur Amaki? Wow. Don't get Centaurs drunk. In fact, nobody should really get drunk. It's just not a good thing. You kind of lose control. You know, tipsy is one thing, but like Centaurs get drunk and they become violent and they become coarse and they become jerks and they're just <laughs> so like father like son just becoming they become terrible and they're scary and they're these giant huge horsemen and they're flipping over tables and they're fighting each other and everyone's like this party kind of stinks and at this party is this guy we'll, we'll say guy named Senius or Senius now Senius wasn't always a guy Senius started out life as a woman and this is a bad story Cineas was carried off against her will by Poseidon. This is kind of shades of maybe Medusa. And Poseidon was quite enamored with Cineas. He's like, give me any wish you want, I'll grant it for you. And Cineas is like, I want to become a guy so you never do this to me again. I, want to, I don't want to be carried off by some creep like you. And this is lost on Poseidon because Poseidon's a creep. He's like, okay, yeah, sure. And he transforms Cineas into a man. And what's more, I guess because he did really have strong feelings for Cineas, he made it so that Cineas cannot be injured by a weapon. So we're kind of dealing with like almost like a, an Achilles before there's an Achilles. Cineas becomes a great hunter. In some versions, Cineas is one of the Argonauts. Uh, he's also involved in the Caledonian bear hunt. I'm going to kind of vacillate between saying he and she, I'm sorry. Uh, this is one of the first transgender characters in literature. And Cineas is very, very, very mighty. Literally can't be injured by weapons. Great hero. Probably the greatest hero at this Lapith's fe feast. But one of the centaurs realizes, like, oh, wait, you're Cineas. And Cineas is like, yeah. And the centaur was a sexist jerk. And was like, so you're like a girl. And Cineas is like, yeah. And so he's like, bet you it means you can't fight. And starts with, in with uh, Cineas. Cineas straight up kills the centaur. But all the centaurs start fighting. They start fighting with the Lapiths. The party is being torn apart. I said tables are being flipped over now. Tables are flying through the air. And they quickly learn as they're grabbing weapons that they can't hurt Cineas. And this is, this is kind of the coolest part, but it's also kind of sad for Cineas. So weapons can't hurt Cineas. So what the centaurs end up doing, the centaurs are incredibly strong. They rip up mountain, not mountains, they rip up giant trees, and sometimes they rip up rocks, whatever it is. The things are aren't strictly speaking weapons, and they start just literally hammering Cineas on the head. And Cineas isn't being killed or even hurt, but they drive her down into the ground. Like, like it's like they're hammering her. And you can see, if you type in, Cineas is spelled like C-A-E-N-E-U-S normally, or just type in like the Centauramaki, you will see illustrations of this, where it's like, there's this figure who's like up to their waist or their shoulders in the ground, and there's centaurs on either side, smashing them with logs, nailing them into the ground. It's kind of weird. I had never heard the story until I actually had moved to Rome, and I would see this in a lot of places, because the Centauramaki was a pretty popular topic of art. I'm like, this is weird. It's like some weird Looney Tunes stuff. And, in, depending on the version of the story, Cineas um, is either, and I think this is how Ovid says it, like Cineas is literally like hit so hard into the ground that he, she keeps traveling down and eventually will end up in Tartarus. I presume she suffocates along the way. Some versions of the story, she just kind of turns into a golden bird and flies away. But this is the end of this hero, like just ignobly murdered at this, this festival. And so the Lapiths are like, we can't have this happen. The people that, you know, Pyrtheus is the king of. So they, they marshal their forces and they start fighting. Well, they've been the whole time, but now they're like, oh my God, she killed the greatest one of us. Know who else is at this thing? Theseus. Theseus gives a nice bit of power for the Lapiths. They probably would have been very outclassed, but they had a full-on son of Poseidon there with them. So they rout the, uh, that's a term you only use when a battle goes really bad, they rout the centaurs. They kill most of them. 
and the centaurs are kind of scattered to the winds, the ones that are left. It's this amazing battle scene. You'd see it on pediments of buildings a lot. You see it on Greek vase paintings a lot. You see it in like little sculptures and things. It was a very popular subject to paint and to draw and create back in the olden days. And so you'll see centaurs pop up in other stories here to there. Um, and there's like there's like definitely a story where Heracles like fights them later, but it seems to be kind of an echo of the same story. But this is like the main thing. And then like this is kind of the destruction of them. They've been driven out and now they are like many of these creatures that the ancient Greeks envisioned, they live on like the edge of the civilized world. And so like, instead of it being this enormous tribe now, you might run into a few scattered centaurs here and there, but that's okay. Cause even one centaur, it's terrifying. It's an enormous strong horse with an enormous strong man on top of it, like as part of it. And it's unlike the Minotaur, they seem to be just as smart as people. So they're pretty intense. Um, Let's see, did I have anything else I want to mention here? Um, oh, little like little uh, side note for Sin, uh, for Sinaeus, who I, I like this character a lot. This might be a story I tell. Um, so the details of his, her fate are kind of up in the air, but it should be mentioned that when... Um, Aeneas goes to the underworld in the Aeneid. If you don't remember, I talk about that in the episode uh, on Aeneid, during Epic, on Aeneas during Epic Heroes Week. He actually sees Aeneas in the underworld, and she's a woman again. So I kind of like that she gets restored to her original state. I feel like the entire time she is a woman. She's just, she's a woman who's been mistreated by the gods. So she takes on this masculine form as a form of protection. I don't know, it's pretty cool. I like that she's invulnerable, and like, I gotta say, it's kind of like, clever that they beat her that way, but like, it also stinks. It's like, oh, I wanna read more stories about her. I don't know, I'm gonna have to do a, I'm gonna have to do a, a deep dive on her, see if I can find any other stories. Like I said, she's an Argonaut sometimes, and she is also uh, on the Caledonian boar hunt, but there's probably other things here and there. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's all I have to say about centaurs. They're pretty cool, I mean, they're not, they're terrible creatures. But like the, the concept of them, it's again, it's one of those beasts. I end up saying this a lot, like how there's some Greek monsters that are so famous, they've transcended you know, their original roots. They're like recognizable the entire world over. And centaurs are one of those creatures, like everyone knows centaurs. Although I just watched, recently watched a cartoon where they kept calling them horse people and like the main character didn't understand they were called centaurs, it was kind of a joke. But <clears throat> yeah. So that is my story on centaurs. So uh, if uh, we have time, I'd love to take some questions. And it looks like we do. Um, Ranka asks, what happened when centaurs asked Atlanta if she was just a girl? Didn't go well for them either. Yeah, actually, and that's a great case of like where you see after the centaurs have been split up as a tribe, you find groups of them, small groups who exist to bedevil and provide, you know, like challenges for other heroes. Yeah, so a couple of centaurs accosted Atalanta. Don't mess with Atalanta, she's awesome. And Atalanta kills them, and she's only like, she's not even fully grown yet, she kills two centaurs. And everyone's like, wow. Cause like normally, a centaur could take out like a whole group of guys, and like this young girl kills two of them. Cause Atalanta is the best. I think we decided she's like maybe the only good hero when we went through. I think we've come across a couple since then. I guess Diomedes is pretty good, but it's slim pickings, man. A lot of those heroes are jerks. Let's see who else we have here. Missed most of the call, but I saw comments about Atlanta. Would be interested to hear more about her. Hellenic Moon, I did an entire episode about Atalanta. It was a while ago. It was Atalanta, right? I didn't just cover something else. But if you check it out on my YouTube, youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians, there's an entire, I think there's an entire episode about her. Man, guys, I've done a lot of these. If somebody knows for sure, because maybe I covered her with someone else, but who else would I cover her with? Pretty sure I did that. Uh, Megan wants to know if there is a lady centaur. That's from Yehi. So, um, weirdly kind of, right? So, in this, most of the stories, especially the stories I'm telling you now, there doesn't seem to be any female centaurs. In later antiquity, and especially in the Roman era, you start seeing female centaurs being pictured. And there's this one bit of text that I came across while doing research for this, like, last night, about Pindar, where he mentions specifically, he's describing, a, oh, you know, he's actually describing a piece of art, which might be, but he's describing specifically a female centaur 
who, they, oh, well, there's two. There's a white one and a black one. So it makes sense, if you go with the idea especially, that Centauros, who was the son of Ixion and Nephili, the cloud, right? Who, you know, poor cloud. Um, that he ends up mating with a bunch of just straight up horses to create the centaur, centaurs. It makes sense that some of those centaurs would be female. Maybe it's one of those things where the female are like, you know, we're gonna go hang out over here and you guys go run around and be wild lunatics. We'll just be kind of chill. So it makes sense to me there's female centaurs. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Centaurides. Centaurides would actually mean son of centaurs. So that would actually be a good name for centaurs. They'd be the son of centauros. Um, Atalanta is a very interesting hero. Did you know that there is a football club in Italy named after her? Atalanta Ber Bergamasca. I did not. That's super cool. Good choice, too. Like, if you're going to name your football club after somebody, Atalanta, she would probably kick some major butt at soccer. Well, football. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, oh, we don't have a lot of questions yet here today. <laughs> yeah, he writes, hmm, Apollo could be a did good democratic leader because he lets others around him surpass him. That's an interesting take on Apollo because he does seem in some stories to be quite motivated by jealousy, but then at the same time, we, we talk about this, like he's surpassed in the healing arts by Asclepius. He's surpassed in the music arts by Orpheus. He's buoyed up constantly by the presence of the Muses and Artemis, all of whom arguably are better at the things that, that, that he is God of, that they can do better. So yeah, it seems like even though he's a guy who doesn't like to, so here's the thing with Apollo, as long as you're not pointing it out to him directly, that he's maybe not as good as the other people, he seems to be very willing to delegate responsibilities and to rely on others to do things. So yeah, he would be a good leader that way. And honestly, he's got to be good at it some way because he does have so many people in his life that help him out. There are other gods we can mention, looking at you, Ares, who have a lot less people in their corner. But Apollo, even though he does do some horrendous and unpleasant things, guy has a lot of people who are willing to go for bat for him. So that shows that Apollo is doing something right. I like that idea that Apollo would be, you know, and he's also, um, his name, Apollo, it has roots in, like, the fact that there was, um, he represents, like, assemblies of young men. He represents assemblies of people coming together. He's like a city god. Like, we're, like he's not like a rustic god, like a god that's out in the woods, like Pan. He's a god that is in cities where groups of people come together for the greater good. So that makes a lot of sense that Apollo would be that. I think Athena normally gets the name for that. She's, you know, she's wiser. But I, I, I feel pretty comfortable saying Apollo would be a pretty good democrat, democratic god. Is there a certain region or place, this is from Renka, associated with Chiron the Centaur Tutor? <laughs> Arcadia, maybe. Uh, he's actually, uh, Arcadia would make a lot of sense because we see a lot of like the, to use the term again, rustic and wild gods come out of there, like Pan and stuff, and Hermes for that matter. Um, normally uh, the centaurs and, um, uh, and, um, Chiron himself are associated actually with like a pretty specific area of Thessaly, one mountain in Thessaly called Mount Pelion, which I mentioned, or Pelion I said at the time. So there was initially that's the area where they were thought to be. And Chiron seems to live out his life there. That's where the heroes would go find him when they need their training and stuff. After their routing by the, um, by the Lapiths, they kind of spread all over the place. And just like if you're on the edge of the world, you might find a centaur or two. Um, how did you come up with the pose of Hermes with one of his elbow backward and the backward jumping? It looks like flying and you know how people cannot fly. I'm not sure, uh, yeah, he, which pose it is. It's like, wait, well, he, he's got one of his elbow backward and like backwards jumping. I'm not sure. Maybe, um, hit me up on uh, Instagram afterwards with a picture and I could, Hermes, I, I tend to treat him like he, like I guess, theoretically, any of the Olympians could fly, although they, I don't think they would, I think they would take the form of a bird. I don't think they fly like Superman fly, where they're like a human and they just go whoosh. Um, that doesn't seem like the thing. I've shown Hera, especially because she is a goddess of the air, I've shown her kind of levitating a few times. Um, Hermes is really the only god I show flying like that. And I kind of treat it a lot of times like he's running on air, or he's kind of just like walking. And he's just kind of like, 
he's kind of a he's a very agile and kind of like hey 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 character. So I probably just drew him in a silly pose like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe you know I don't know if you guys know, but I do a lot of silly poses too. So it's probably just a pose I took sometime. Uh, the Atlanta Bergamasca Football Club is playing the most important match in their history on August 12th. Atlanta versus PSG in Champions League quarterfinals. We certainly have a fan of football here. Nice. Um, what else do we have? Uh, how does a cloud give birth and why half horse? Yeah, there's some good questions about there. So the cloud bit is really interesting because some versions of the story don't give, it's just a cloud. But then like the cloud gives birth. So to me that means Ixion, he's just immortal. So uh, means the cloud, there's not like a special power in there. The cloud has to stick around for a while afterwards. And not only that, the cloud needs to be fashioned into something that is actually able to mate with a human. So I like that in some versions of the story, um, I maybe wrote that, and Pindar actually is one of the ones where um, the cloud is, I think that's maybe the only one where the cloud is given the name of Nephili. I feel like there's a cool story to explore in there where Zeus, just trying to do his, have his gotcha moment on this guy, he trans he makes this cloud, you know, he, clouds are part of his, his specialty. He kind of function like forms this cloud, which also keep in mind, must have looked exactly like Hera, because it fooled Ixion. So he basically makes a cloud version of his own queen, his own wife, but must have actually given her life. Like, not just like a cloud simulacrum, like she becomes a being that goes on to live after this and give birth. It's kind of like, kind of tragic and sad. Like it kind of makes me want to do a short story just exploring this character who was just kind of in a moment of vengeance, jealousy, curiosity. Zeus kind of scrambles off this life form and then just kind of forgets her. And then she begats this entire race of like these kind of like wild, like horse people. It's kind of cool. I don't know, it's, it's there's some, there's some good material to explore in there, I think. Uh, does anyone have a chariot pulled by centaurs? And yeah, he, that's from Rankin. Yeah, he's like, wow, a chariot pulled by centaurs. I don't think so. Centaurs are, what they kind of represent in the Greek world is like untamed power. Like they represent wild stuff that you can't, you can't tame a centaur. Chiron is kind of weird there that he's, He's like the higher side of human has taken prevalence there, but he's not tamed in that way. Like the centaurs would never, I can't imagine what would break a centaur to allow them to be pull a chair. Like, okay, an Olympia could come down and like force them. But I think the centaurs would just refuse to walk. I think they would choose death rather than pull that. You couldn't, a centaur in its very nature wouldn't allow itself to be bound that way. I mean, it might be overwhelmed but it just wouldn't, it, its spirit wouldn't be broken that way. Like they, it's so, and I think they would literally will themselves to die if it came down to that. <laughs> and Renka's dad says, maybe don't let them drink and die, drive. Dad joke, eye roll. That's a pretty good dad joke though. Yeah, definitely don't. Uh, that's actually a pretty cool idea. Yeah, he adds, someone who achieves that must be a real hero. Yeah, it would be very interesting to see who could do it. I feel like the way to do it somehow, like, I'm just gonna throw Atalanta as a possibility because she could impress them on the wild side. She was raised by a bear. She knows the wild stuff. Because I think you would have to be able to physically dominate them, uh, like to be able to beat them up, straight up beat them up. And she could, we know that. She killed two of them when she was a child. But then they would also have to have a respect for you. It would have to be a really deep respect. So maybe like she would have to like beat them up real bad somehow, but like spare them in a way that didn't feel like pity. Like, maybe, like, she's beating them up and, like, they get attacked by another creature and she saves them. Or she just does something impressive. Maybe she saves a baby centaur. It would have to be something where they know that she could physically defeat them and they also respect her at the same time. Uh, Mr. Wizard Wannabe writes, How do you imagine a god claims a dominion? Like, Zeus and his brothers claim them theirs, but what about his kids? Did he assign them? Ask the fates? That's a great question, Mr. Wizard. Depends. I feel like that's actually something I'm kind of playing with in Dionysus, where there's a scene in the Dionysus book, I'm going to describe it to you. It's pretty far along, where Zeus has been kind of watching the goings-on on Earth of this kid of his, Dionysus. And he had done a lot of stuff in Dionysus' youth to hide Dionysus, to protect him. And now Dionysus is out there being very public and kind of making himself very 
obvious that he wants to be a god. He wants to be an Olympian. And Zeus is like, I don't understand why he acts this way. And it's actually Demeter gives him some advice. She's like, hey, uh, believe you, I know something about like having your kids rebel against you. And I think he's trying to find his place in the world. And I think what he's doing is he's finding, like, most of the world's been claimed. So he's finding new ways to be a god, a new type of god in this world. And so I think it's a lot like that. I feel like sometimes it's definitely a sign. Like, Hermes has so many jobs because Zeus is like, we gotta keep this guy out of trouble. And the dude is so fast and so smart and so hyperactive, they keep having to give him more and more stuff. But sometimes, and like, then there's Artemis who just claims her stuff. When she's a little girl, she's like, I want this, this, and this. And so, oh, you're the goddess of the hunt. Ares, I think his bellicose nature just won out, and they're like, he's God of War, definitely. But I think sometimes, so I think it's all different matters. I think it depends on the God. But it is a really interesting question, right? Like, what determines that? A lot of times it seems to be the parents. Sometimes we see characters kind of make sense the way they are because of the mix of the parents. It kind of, like, you know, the way Persephone is, hits a lot of the same territory as her mom, Demeter, because just makes sense they would both be gods of growing things that is a uh the gods who are not manifest just manifestations oh he's adding to it like aphrodite yeah some of the gods are just like personifications like uh aries like kids like um uh whatchamacallit um not kratos and ba uh oh my god i'm blanking they're the moons um fear and panic but i'm thinking i'm blanking on their names right now ah somebody will tell me uh, okay. <laughs> My brain broke. It's been a long day, guys. So, um, looks like we're almost done here. Do we have any more questions? Or Pho oh, Phobos and Demos. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wizard. That was killing me. Killing me. I love when you guys can just come in and help me out with these things. So, um, yeah, let me just close this up to say again. So, yeah, just so you know, this next Friday, in two days, No Geek Speaks Greek. You could see me instead on reddit and i'll be on reddit talking about my new book on rig i'll be me and the author dan newman it's an ask me anything so you guys can ask us questions we'll do our best to answer so that'll be instead of geek speaks greek this friday the week after that i'm going on vacation i'm gonna go upstate new york i'm gonna be like near a farm i'm gonna play with baby goats kids as they're called it's gonna be really fun then i come back and the week after that I'm shifting Geek Speaks Greek to Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We've hit so many characters at this point. Part of the reason is I'm kind of running out of big names to do. I'm like, woo, who am I going to do? So um, thank you all for your kind wishes about my vacation. Uh, I'll be posting stuff in the meantime, and I'll definitely be posting things to remind people about, you know, the new schedule, about the AMA, about stuff. If you decide that you want to get a signed copy of Unrig, go to Word Bookstores today and buy it because I'm biking over to Word Tomorrow to sign a bunch of books. So if you want a signed copy, do it now and then you'll get a signed copy with a drawing. And uh, that's it. So thank you all for tuning in and I'll see you all soon. All right, bye-bye everyone.